Um, so if you've been with us before for one of these sessions, um, you'll have a sense of the format uh, that we'll be using. Jeff and I will be talking to Saiko about her excellent new book. We'll be looking at some objects from the collection. Uh, we're going to take a short break at about 8.15 8 if we get the chance. Um, but we'd particularly welcome questions from you uh, out there. Um, so if you do have any questions about Wordsworth in relation to tourism, in relation to, uh, to guidebooks, and particularly in relation to modern travel, which is going to be the focus for much of, of the conversation today, then do, do please let us know. We'll be sketching just in a moment. Um, we'll ask Saiko to sketch the extent of the book, so you'll get a sense of the fascinating areas um, that she's been, been looking at. Just before um, I introduce Saiko, um, a reminder that we're recording the event, um, but uh, it's only the, us panelists who will be visible and whose faces uh, will, be, will be recorded. So Saiko Yoshikawa is Professor of English at Kobe City University of Foreign Studies and a former Secretary General of the Japan Association for English Romanticism. Here in England, Saiko has frequently attended and spoken at the Wordsworth Summer Conference, and she has for many years researched in the archive at the Jerwood Centre. In 2015, Saiko published a collection of Edward Thomas's poems, which she translated into Japanese. And she's also the author of two books about Wordsworth. Uh, one of these is William Wordsworth and the Invention of Tourism, 1820 to 1900, um, which is a fantastic account of uh, as the title suggests, Wordsworth's relationship to growing tourism, and it draws very heavily on the influence of Lake District guidebooks. So as Jeff says, it's lovely to have those, those books in, in the background. Um, and I'm sure Saiko will be happy to answer questions about uh, Wordsworth and tourism in that period more generally. Um, her second book, which has, has just come out this year, is William Wordsworth and Modern Travel, Railways, Motor Cars and the Lake District. 1830 to 1940, published by Liverpool University Press. And um, that's going to be our focus uh, this evening. And as we mentioned, if you're interested in buying this book, which again is a, is a superb book, I'd thoroughly recommend. Um, it's currently available at half price using the code that Hannah has kindly uh, put in the, uh, in the chat for us. Um, and currently, uh, Saiko is preparing a new edition of Wordsworth's Guide to the Lakes for Oxford University Press's Wordsworth Classic series. So welcome, Saiko. Thank you very much uh, for joining us. It's great to have you here. Uh, congratulations on the book. Uh, it's another one in our series that, that I, I've really enjoyed. I mean, um, just to tell people the kinds of things that they will get if they, if they um, are able to get hold of the book, if they buy the book. I mean, one of the things I found absolutely fascinating facts here, um, you know, for example, that Wordsworth um, took his first ride in a train uh, in 1839, which is not how you think of Wordsworth at all. So really interesting. And it's full of those kinds of great first moments. You know, 1897, the first motorist ventures into the Lake District. Uh, 1903, the first public motor vehicle or bus comes into the Lake District. So um, I, I say really enjoyed those facts. They, they constitute a fascinating history of the Lake District um, over the last 200 years. As Jeff says, they, uh, they anticipate a number of the debates which are ongoing at the moment about access to the Lake District, preservation of the Lake District, who owns or who should be responsible for the Lake District. Um, and also they obviously offer a, a fascinating um, uh, account of the sort of the, the oscillations in Wordsworth's own fortunes and, uh, uh, and reputation. Um, and it's, you know, it's a very interestingly global book as well. I mean, you're interested with international tourism. You know, I couldn't help but, but mention, I wanted to ask you about the, you know, another of these firsts, which was the, the first Japanese visitor uh, mm -hmm. to Dove Cottage, who uh, I think is uh, uh, Yaichiro Isobi, if I pronounce that correctly, who comes in at 1899. Mm -hmm. um, you offer a fascinating account of his visit to Dove Cottage to, to Rydal Mount. Um, of the fact that he, he measures Wordsworth's grave, as you yeah. say, about the poet in the thorn, uh, and you, you've got a lovely image of um, his signature in the visitor's book. And I, I just wondered if you could tell us a bit, you know, both from your personal perspective and in terms of your research, you know, about Wordsworth and, and Japan. You know, um, is he a big presence in, in Japanese culture? And, you know, how, how did you first come across uh, mm -hmm. Wordsworth? Okay, uh, thank you very much. Uh, uh, thank you for uh, inviting me for this talk. I'm very 
glad, but I'm a bit nervous, but I'm very glad to be here and I'd like to um, talk as, as much as I can. Uh, so the first question is about wordless and uh, in Japanese. I think in the 19th century and uh, the late 19th and early uh, 20th century, when uh, Japan uh, tried to westernize and modernize its uh, lifestyle and translated uh, several uh, English literature into Japanese. Uh, was that poetry was really um, popular. And I think probably it, it is probably because uh, uh, was a description of nature and his idea of um, plain living and high thoughts uh, were in tune with a Japanese love of rural landscape and the aesthetic of a simple way of life. So I think uh, in the 19th century and early 20th century was this that was uh, quite popular in Japan. So the the, about the 10 to 20 people every year I uh, came to visit uh, the cottage. But um, how about the present time? Mm -hmm. I'm not quite sure. Um, until the 1970s, uh, the daffodil poem was taught at high school. But uh, when I was a high school student, I, I didn't learn it. And uh, I had not even heard of his name until I entered the university and I started to, to study English um, poetry. So um, I, I cannot say that was this um, is now well read in, in Japan. But uh, well, he, in my class, uh, in my uh, class of English department, I think uh, he's uh, quite popular. And um, perhaps because uh, uh, the experiences and uh, feelings that was described in, in his poem, poetry have some universal appeal. This is very interesting, but what was has a very strong sense, sense of place, but at the same time, his poetry has something universally appeal. So that, so that is what uh, we, um, we are attracted to his poetry. And on the other hand, um, when the Lake District became uh, popular among Japanese tourists, I think it's about the eight, uh, 1980s and 1990s. Um, this is thanks to uh, Beatrix Potter, uh, the Peter Rabbit. Uh, and then when, the, yes, when Peter Rabbit Lake District uh, became popular, that cottage also became popular. So I think this has uh, something to do with uh, the fact that uh, literary tourism has long been uh, part of Japanese tourism culture. Um, we, we like uh, visiting places which have uh, some literary association, uh, starting with Basho and then um, and the Lady the Murasaki's Tale of Genji, and uh, recently um, the Haruki Murakami, or uh, the, some places featured in films. Uh, uh, those places are very uh, popular for um, tourism, uh, tourists. And uh, uh, several guidebooks. Uh, Popular guidebooks to Britain uh, uh, include uh, information of uh, Dove Cottage and Rider Mount, uh, along with the houses of Shakespeare, uh, Burns, uh, Bronte, Hardy, yes, and those kind of people. So in a way, I think uh, it is through tourism that Wordsworth uh, has come to be known to general Japanese. Mm. But in this point, I think a wild versus garden is also very important. In the Japanese uh, way of making gardens, we have a, a concept of um, borrowing landscape or mm. borrow landscape, uh, which means that uh, when, when we uh, try to make a garden, we try to incorporate the surrounding landscape into the, oh. into the uh, uh, garden. So I think uh, this concept is uh, materialized in Wild versus Garden in the cottage and Rider right Mount. His uh, garden used uh, the, the hilly, uh, hilly side, the slope uh, very well. And then um, uh, his gardens are in, uh, in good harmony with the surrounding mountains and lakes. And this is uh, what I think uh, appeals to uh, Japanese uh, sensibilities. And, uh, Myself, whenever I visit um, that cottage garden or ride among gardens, I, I always feel as if I am uh, walking in some uh, mountain gardens in Kyoto or Kamakura. Yes, yeah, so this is something that is interesting. Uh, 
So uh, I think there are um, four elements. So was a, one um, was a description of nature, and two, his concept of simple life, and three, his gardens in harmony with nature, and four, uh, Japan's long tradition of literary tourism. I think these four elements are what attract uh, Japanese people to Wagua. Mm -hmm. Well, well, for many years, um, we had a very high proportion of visitors from Japan. Um, mm -hmm. I, I can't remember. It was a big, it was a big figure, sort of almost 30%, I'm, I'm thinking. And, and people <laughs> would often say, um, okay. pe people would often say, why do you have so many visitors from Japan? Well, I wish I'd had that answer <laughs> to tell yeah, them, because that, yeah. that was just a great answer. Um, mm -hmm. And I'm thinking that, you know, they called their garden, didn't they? Their little domestic mm -hmm. slip of mountain. It was just a, a, a microcosm, really, of the valley. Um, you mentioned Basho in your mm -hmm. answer, mm -hmm. and uh, some, some people joining us tonight might remember we did an exhibition on words of Basho, I think it was 2014, mm -hmm. and then you welcomed us um, for a return uh, exhibition mm -hmm. in, in 2016. Um, mm -hmm. So that was a wonderful link um, yeah. between yeah. us when we had some words with manuscripts in Kobe. Yeah. Um, like Simon, I, I, I loved your book. Um, many of the things he said uh, exactly uh, what I found interesting. Um, that that sort of, um, if you like, that conversation um, between access and, and preservation. Uh, the roads, in particular, in your book. You know, how many roads is enough roads just to give access, but actually not to not to spoil the area. Um, and I particularly enjoyed too the the more modern aspects, the 1930s, uh, where you talk about the rise of the, the preservation there and the mm -hmm. Friends of the Lake District. So I, I reached from a book you mentioned, um, the Simmons book of the Lake District, and there's a postscript at the end where he says, you know, after, this is 1938, where he's calling for uh, the formation of the Friends of the Lake District. Mm -hmm. And he says that he's the, I think he's the chairman of the secretary. And then mm -hmm. he gives his address, which is Wood Close, which is like 300 yards up the hill from Dove Cottage. And I thought that was mm -hmm. a wonderful, kind of connection. In your first book, um, uh, this book, um, you, you do cover the, the early part of the 19th century, obviously Wordsworth very much alive at that time, and how it becomes known as Wordsworth Country or Wordsworth Shire. I, I wonder, Seiko, if we could ask you just to, to cover some of this as an introduction perhaps to the, to the second book that we'll, we'll focus on. Mm -hmm. Um, okay, yes, uh, the, the, my two books are linked together, so the, uh, uh, we'll talk about, uh, a little about my first book, uh, William Wordsworth and the Invention of Tourism. And this book deals with how our Wordsworthian tourism uh, developed in the 19th century uh, the, and how the cultural landscape called uh, the Lake, uh, cultural landscape of the Lake District as Wordsworth Country was constructed through this um, practice. Um, it started with um, some enthusiastic Wordsworth devotees around, I think, uh, 18, uh, 10, uh, mid 1810s, who made literary pilgrimage uh, by visiting the poet at Rydal Mount, and after his death, by visiting uh, the, his grave at um, Grasmere. They also tried to find places and uh, scenes described in in his uh, poems, uh, such as uh, Wishing Gate, uh, Dungeon Gill, um, Isle Horse, or Blee Town. And um, as other houses at the cottage, uh, Hawks and Coconuts, uh, were also sought out. Then uh, this kind of uh, literary tourism was gradually incorporated into uh, the tourist industry, uh, as these places were uh, introduced in popular guidebooks with uh, vast quotations and illustrations and uh, une some anecdotes and uh, maps. Now, when the uh, railway came to uh, Windamia, so uh, numerous uh, tourists came here with guidebooks, including words of um, quotations. And um, uh, usually, coaches, uh, horse drawn coaches, were waiting for uh, these railway tourists. And uh, the coaches took them to several places which uh, related uh, with, uh, uh, with the poet. And then coach driver was uh, also good, good guys. And they, they talked about, they, they, they gave uh, the passenger the, some interesting anecdotes of Wordsworth and then pointing out uh, his grave or his houses, uh, et cetera, et cetera. So uh, in, in this way, 
uh, appreciating the lake district landscape through uh, was as this works and life uh, gradually uh, spread and uh, became a, a kind of norm and the making uh, the cultural landscape uh, called uh, was a country by the end of the 19th century. So the, this kind of thing I, I have been looking through in the former book and uh, then my present book are now going into the 20th century and how this has been changed or not changed uh, in the 20th century. Thank you very much. I mean, it's such a fascinating uh, subject. Um, would you mind sort of talking us through the new book then, Psycho? I mean, obviously the, um, the, the title there gives us some indication of the, um, the main topics, William Words with Modern Travel, Railways, Motor Cars, uh, and the Lake District. Um, and, yeah, I found, as I said, I found it fascinating. So I'm looking forward to hearing what you say. We know a bit about Wordsworth and Railways, but I didn't know anything about Wordsworth and Motor Cars. Um, <laughs> I really enjoy that. There's also a lot more in the book, uh, as I'm sure you can tell us. I mean, the cycle tours, for example, I found fascinating. Stuff about the wars you write mm -hmm. about is incredibly interesting. So, yeah, if you could, if you could sketch for our uh, uh, attendees, our mm -hmm. participants, you know, the, the broad areas, um, mm -hmm. and we can pick up on some of those themes for them in discussion. And I, I think, I mean, it might be, I think we may have some, some pictures as well. So if it's useful mm -hmm. at this point to feed anything in, just let mm -hmm. us know. Okay, so the, uh, uh, Jeff, could you uh, please uh, prepare the... Can you see that? Yeah, we've got that, yeah. Great. Something strange has happened. It, everyone, can, can everyone see the pictures? Right here, I, I'm seeing, watching some strange images. What, what is it? So that should be the pine image you can see. Oh, yes, yeah. okay. Yes, yeah, good, okay. So the, um, this book I explore the Wazafa's uh, continuous influence on the uh, terrestrial landscape of the Lake District um, in the uh, age of railways, motor cars, and uh, during and after First World War. And the uh, chapters one and two deal with uh, railways. So the, uh, this painting, I will talk about this uh, painting later again, but this shows a uh, train just uh, uh, about to leave uh, Windermere station, station, and this is uh, the Kendall and Windermere Railway, uh, to which was uh, famously uh, opposed. Um, could you change the picture? Then next one. Yeah, yeah. that should show it. Mm -hmm. Next should. one, please. And then next one. Oh, well, Yes, yes, thank you. So the, uh, but uh, despite of, uh, despite was a uh, vigorous uh, position and the railway opened and, um, and this was a welcome, uh, railway opened in April 1847 and welcomed by many as these images show. Uh, this, the, the, the right image is the uh, second class ticket issued in celebration of opening of the line. And the uh, uh, left image is from a Westmoreland Gazette, uh, 24 April 1847, a full, full page account of the event with 10 illustrations featuring uh, several tourist attractions along the line. And what is rather interesting and uh, maybe ironical is that the image of Bridal Mount is also included. Can, can, can you see that the, the right? Uh, yes, yeah. that, that's one. That one is a ride on mount. So the, in a way, uh, the, this railway was expected to attract Wadsworthian tourists, and actually it did. So here yeah, we, we can see the, the how complicated the relationship between Wadsworth and uh, railways. So uh, chapter one discusses why Wadsworth opposed the railway and what reaction he, he received and how ambiguous uh, his, uh, was, uh, was, was his attitude toward railway. And then um, chapter two uh, explores how this was with this anti railway argument were variously redeployed by Victorian uh, conservationists such as John Ruskin, H.G. Uh, Ronsley, and uh, Gordon Wadsworth, 
the please next image. Next image, yes. Um, this uh, map shows a proposed Ambleside Railway in 1887. After the opening of Kendall and Windermere Railway in 1847, the lake distance was continuously beset by uh, disputes about uh, proposed railways, among which the most controversial was the project, the project to extend the Kendra and Windermere Railway to Ambleside and uh, possible to Grasmia and further to uh, Keswick. So uh, several railway controversies uh, discussed in, in chapter two. So if we could stop railways, uh, no one could stop motor cars. And so chapter three and four uh, deal with early motor uh, travelers in the lake district. Next, please. So uh, this is one of the first motor cars that came to the lake district. Uh, Henry Starmis Daimler. Uh, in 1897, he made a trial run from John McGraw to Land's End. And on the way, he made a, uh, he made a detour and dropped in at um, Ambleside via uh, Carkston Pass. He left a very lively account of his breakneck descent of uh, the steep and very difficult twisty struggle. Mm -hmm. And uh, uh, next one, please. And uh, this, uh, this is when the famous uh, thousand mile trial run came to Kendall in spring 1900. Uh, in the Lake District, about 50 cars run from Kendall to uh, Keswick across Dunmel Ray. And this photo shows the Kendall people gathering to see the novelty that the local people getting there. Within a decade of these events, motor tourists began to uh, penetrate all uh, corners of the Lake District. And their number, as their numbers increased, so did uh, complaints about dust, noise, fumes, speed, and damages to peaceful landscapes by the construction of roads. So chapter three discusses how our remote tourism gave great impact on uh, Lake District landscape and uh, how it transformed people's awareness of uh, environment in which they live and uh, travel. Then uh, chapter four. Chapter four uh, reveals uh, how the early motorist and the new way inherited was Russian or romantic spirit. Early motorists, uh, early motors have a uh, rudimentary and uh, without a roof. So motorists could enjoy a physical sensation of moving through various landscapes, feeling the rain, wind, um, sunshine, and the undulation of the ground. And interestingly, the early motorists drew on romantic and Wadsworthian images and language to describe their new mobilized uh, perceptions and uh, bodily sensations. And, and like Wadsworth and Ruskin, these motorists didn't like railways because uh, it deprived a personal independence. They praised uh, freedom of travel and self-reliance, like water, and loved to explore the wild nature inaccessible by the railway. Uh, could you show us the next one? Yes, uh, this is uh, um, G.D. Abraham, an oldie car. The first motor, he, he, uh, he's uh, the first motorist to drive over Hard Knot Pass in 1913. Uh, this picture is from 1920, but he, he did it uh, in 1913. So chapter four explores how a remote uh, how uh, the romantic ethos of nature love, the freedom of wayfaring and uh, personal independence were revitalized by uh, in early motorist and uh, cyclist uh, poetic of uh, road. And then chapter five, yes, uh, Wordsworth, as a champion of, of freedom of self-reliance, was also uh, revalued during the First World War. 
Chapter 5 reveals how the Great War brought a remarkable upturn in world affairs and reputation, and how it had an in inescapable impact on the cultural landscape of the Lake District. World of uh, patriotic passion were connected with his with his wish to protect the Lake District as a national uh, heritage and um, uh, encouraged people to secure Lakeland Mountain by uh, preserving them as a um, war memorial to those who fought and died for uh, British liberty. So could you show us the next picture? So um, this is a photo of uh, unveiling of uh, the memorial tablet on Great Gable, June uh, 1924. Then um, the war, the First World War, also affected motor tourism in the post-war years. So chapter six explores tourism during the interwar period, uh, focusing on the impact of uh, mass motorization on the Lake District. Liberated from oppressed mood, just like the past summer after uh, the lockdown, <laughs> and a great number of people rushed to the Lake District, boosted by uh, uh, the nationwide boom of Sharpan tourism. Could you uh, show us mm -hmm. next one? So the, this, uh, look at this uh, photo. It is remarkable, uh, such many uh, Sharpans in and file crossing down the rail and the next image, please. Sorry? Is this the, oh yes, yeah, this one. Uh, th this is a Sharaban. So the, it is remarkable. Oh, so, such many people, almost 20 people, I think, uh, 20 people is in very small Sharaban, and all people were dressed up. <laughs> then they came to the Lake District to, to enjoy the, the scenery. And then the uh, uh, the like the former photos, uh, this Sharaban made a file and then uh, going through the this A591, it's wonderful. So, and but this kind of um, road congestion caused uh, local conflicts, uh, a local complaint and conflicts, and that the, the popularization of motoring uh, paradoxically brought a bold for both for open air activities and the renewal of romantic pedestrianism. Thanks to transport revolution, now everyone could uh, come to the Lake District for enjoying walking. And such organizations as Youth Postal uh, Association or Lumblers Association were formed to uh, announce this trend. Um, can, you see, can you show the next one? Yes. Uh, this, uh, this uh, photo shows uh, a hiker uh, walking to uh, Patadale uh, in about 1930. So chapter seven discusses how this outdoor uh, boom renewed people's interest in weather as a walking poet. And uh, this chapter also explores how increasing reputation of weather in overseas uh, country and the thriving global tourism helped to announce the cultural identity of the Lake District as a world country. Yes, yeah, so this is uh, the outline of the book. Okay, mm -hmm. it's fantastic, and and I love I love some of the pictures you show and the the the, uh, the motor car coming down the pass, mm -hmm. but also that Sharaban and um, I seem to remember you saying in the book that Sharabans were made from the chassis. Of, a, of an army vehicle from the from the First World War yeah, yeah. with with sort of wooden planks over the top, and so they yeah. were initially quite basic um, basic <laughs> vehicles. And the one the one the ones coming down the hill look impossibly <laughs> steep, don't they? Yeah, um, yeah, very <laughs> dangerous, very thrilling. <laughs> yeah. So the, you you had a slide there of the um, 1887 railway proposal, but your your book has got um, two or three maps of proposed railways. And, and, and again, until I, I read your book, I had no idea there were so many different schemes, so many plans uh, that, that were proposed, but, but obviously many of them didn't, didn't come to anything. But would you be able to talk us through some of those, please? 
Okay, yes. Um, so the to to the next, yes. Uh, so um, this map shows uh, the proposed route realized and realized for the Lancaster and Carlisle uh, Railway in the 1830s. Uh, the solid line uh, shows the adopted line, so the, the present line, and the uh, broken lines are uh, the unreal, unrealized ones. So to connect uh, Lancaster and Carlisle, uh, various routes were uh, considered. The westernmost one is the coastal route going from uh, Lancaster across Morgan Bay and uh, going along the western coast of the Lake District going northward to, to walk into Maryland Port and then Carlisle. And then on the other hand, the, the, uh, the easternmost one was uh, the route coming again from Lancaster uh, through uh, Loon Valley. And then Jeff said that if you, you, you are interested in the one going through long thread scale. <laughs> Why are you interested in it? Just, just remarkable. Um, yes, uh, this, this line and go through long thread there and then going, uh, going up to uh, hold water. Yeah. And um, well, I think among these uh, several possible routes, the most important one is uh, the, the, the lake route going through the center of Lake District, um, which could be called uh, Dunmel Railway. Uh, well, Dunmel Railway is, uh, is a, a, not a name for a single project, but a, a general term for all kinds of uh, railway projects to connect uh, Windermere Ambuslite, Rydal, Dunmel Raid, Ketik. Uh, yeah. so then, then this line was mooted for the uh, first time in 1837. And then up until the 20th century, the, the mid 20th century, um, repeatedly proposed this, this route. So could you show yeah. me the next one? So yes, uh, this. Um, is a map of uh, projected railways in the Lake District in the late 19th century. And uh, well, maybe you can get uh, some sense of it. And uh, could you show us the next uh, chronology, please? Yes, uh, this is a chronology. Um, so the, the, well, this is not a uh, inclusive, but uh, I picked up some um, chief ones and only passenger lines. And the bold uh, black ones are realized today, right? And then um, red ones uh, and realized ones. And usually these uh, red ones, these red lines were rejected because of uh, economic reasons, because they're economically not viable, uh, but uh, chief reasons. But there were uh, some lines like Ambuside Railway and Enadel Railway, which arose uh, anti-railway uh, campaigns for uh, protectionist reasons, some environmental reasons. Then um, personally, I like the project of the Langdale and Windermere Tramway in 1867. Uh, this line runs from the uh, farthest reach of Great Langdale, passing the old and the new Dungeon Deal hotels. And um, along uh, uh, the south side of Great Langdale back uh, towards Outer Water and Skillis Bridge, then following the banks of River Brasse onto the Roman Fort um, in Ambuside. So this, this route is now a very uh, popular route for hikers and uh, I think it would be very fascinating, fascinating if uh, this railway had been um, realized. Then, could you show us the third? Yes, the, the here, uh, uh, yes. The, the last project was uh, uh, in um, 1921, Ambuside and Kedic Railway. And this is uh, the plan. Uh, for the route made by the engineer, Novo Cell. It's a bit um, small, but uh, this shows a line from Ambleside 
running under Rufflick, going uh, between Ryder and um, Grasmere Lake, and then crossing Dunmere Lake and passing the eastern side of Dalmere, then coming westward to uh, uh, Darwin's Water. So it's going to passing through five lakes, very touristic uh, line. And then the noble fellow, the engineer, uh, assures that this new railway would not cause such troubles as smoke, dirt, or noise because it, it uses electric, elect, electric petrol engine and that uh, this would not destroy the uh, scenery by avoiding high bank uh, bridges or a viaduct. Above all, he emphasized that this line would relieve traffic congestion on the busy uh, A591. So now, for the first time, the uh, railway was uh, regarded environmentally friendly uh, transport. And uh, many were uh, convinced that it was pre uh, preferable to the constant streams of uh, dust raising sharpens. And there were even those who, who said that the Wazarus would now welcome the railway as a cheap, safe, and clean way of traveling. Yes, it is very interesting. Yes, yeah, so that. So, again, that's fascinating. And, and yeah. you, you talk about the number of schemes that, that, that come across the obstacle of Dunmail Rays. Mm -hmm. And then they, they either, you either go through Dunmail Rays or you go over it in which case the railway would have to go quite high along the mountainside in Grasmere to, to, to gain the gradient. Um, we, we've got one or two uh, nice things. If I can leave the PowerPoint for a moment, uh, Seiko. Um, just um, just a, a couple of years ago, um, a, a Grasmere resident uh, gave, um, if that works, yeah, Gave, the, gave a timetable for the Windermere Railway. And I, I don't know if you've seen this on your visits to the library, but um, the, this, is a, this is from 1847. Ooh, and, uh, and it's got the up trains and the down trains. Mm -hmm. I'm hoping that's a little bit in focus. Um, mm -hmm. And uh, so you could leave Windermere at uh, 7.15 in the morning mm -hmm. and you would get to London 8.45 wow. that evening. So mm -hmm. that's... that's must have seemed pretty miraculous um, at the time. But uh, a number of trains a day, as, as you can see, and those are obviously the ones returning. Yeah, I think there were much more services uh, than, than present day, you know. Yeah. yeah. Good. Oh, interesting. Yeah. And as you, you've mentioned to me too, um, mm -hmm. That word that the 1846 guide to the lakes also has a map of the of the Windermere yeah. Railway. Mm -hmm. um, if we if we maybe just have a look at that for a moment. Um, so this is the 1846 guide, um, words yeah. of scenery that was Wordsworth's, of course. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, here is a map. It's been well used and reinforced with linen. And uh, if I can possibly show it, there's is that is that visible? There's there's Kendall, yeah, um, with the train mm -hmm. coming up here and turning off the branch line. So th this was a year before, before the railway the, actually opened. Yes, yeah, so the the water side uh, already showed this railway line before the the opening of the railway. So it's quite ironic <laughs> the water <Wazza's> guide. <laughs> announce the coming of the railway. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Mm, interesting. So Psycho, probably the uh, most famous piece of writing by Wordsworth is the, the sonnets that he writes to protest about mm -hmm. what at that stage was the planned um, yeah. Kendall Windermere uh, mm -hmm. railway. And I mean, you, you've got so much fascinating information on that. I mean, I had no idea, for example, that it was it was reprinted um, over 60 times. Mm -hmm. um, so it has this very wide circulation um, and is very um, widely parodied as well. I mean, there's, yeah. there's very yeah. funny stuff in the book in people in response to Wordsworth, which we might come mm -hmm. to 
in just a moment. But I thought maybe I might read the sonnet out to remind mm -hmm. people of this, this famous piece of writing. Mm -hmm. And I think Jeff has also um, got, got uh, uh, one of the treasures of the trust for us there, which is a, a proof copy mm. of it. Is, is now a good time to have a look at that, Jeff? It is, uh, unless we want a break for two minutes. Um, do you, should we read the sonnet and then come back and look at the manuscript? Mm -hmm. Unless we want to, how, how are you feeling, Seiko? Would you like to take a break now and we can come back and look at the sonnet mm -hmm. after, okay. after five minutes? Yeah, yeah. All right. Yeah. So, okay, so we'll, we'll break for five minutes. So, just to advertise what will be happening after the break in best ITV fashion, uh, we're going to be looking at Wordsworth's most uh, uh, famous, perhaps controversial, writing on the railways um, mm -hmm. and uh, looking at a proof version of it where we can actually see his amendments and getting Psycho's take on um, what she makes to this very famous piece of writing. So we won't be gone for long. Uh, we'll be back in uh, just three minutes or so. So look forward to seeing you all then. Okay, welcome okay. back everybody. Um, very nice to be here. We have already had some, uh, some questions put in the chat box. And one of the nice things is people have actually been answering them too. Um, which is, which is great to see. So there's been a lot of interest in uh, the figure of Abraham, whose great shot he showed us, Psycho, um, of um, the, the card descending the hard not pass, I think. And um, you know, someone was asking if that's the same fellow who had the postcard business and uh, Margaret Graver has sort of clarified for us. Yes, uh, these are the same Abrams who were the, pi the Abrams who were the pioneers in photographing rock climbing beginning in the 1860s, when one of them was apprenticed to Alfred, Alfred Pettit. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, I think you know some people will know Henry Eden from um, the Kendall Mountain Festival, who I think did a recreation of taking the Abraham camera up oh. into the Lake District Mountains and, and oh, taking yeah. some photos. Um, mm -hmm. We've had some very other inf interesting um, information put in there, uh, and also a question which we may come to at the end. Um, mm -hmm. A very interesting question from uh, Martha Lang, who was asking, mm -hmm. is it Wordsworth or is it the beauty? of the Lake District. And you've got a lovely passage on that at the end of the book, which I thought we might, or Jeff and I thought we might ask you to, um, to, to, to read. Um, I think I, I'm told actually, um, uh, Margaret Graver may be Bruce Graver. So, <laughs> so thank you very much, Bruce, uh, for, that, for that information, using somebody else's Zoom account there. Thank you. Um, great, so welcome back everyone. Uh, we wanted to start off then, Psycho, if we can, with um, Wordsworth's famous sonnet um, mm -hmm. on the Kendall Windermere mm -hmm. Railway, um, which, as I say, I'm going to read out. And I think mm -hmm. Jeff is going to show us this proof copy that the, the Trust have. Um, mm -hmm. And so the version I'm going to read is the version you reproduce in the book, which is the one that Wordsworth publishes in the, in the Morning Post, yeah. uh, dating it October the 12th, 1844. Mm -hmm. And then Wordsworth republishes this in, in, in the pamphlet, doesn't he? Yeah. What I believe we can see in um, the, uh, the proof that Jeff is about to show us mm -hmm. is um, are, the, are, the, change, are the, uh, the changes um, mm -hmm. Wordsworth makes. So I'll just mm -hmm. let you... So... Yeah, excellent. Okay. Is that okay? Yeah, perfect. <laughs> So I'll, do, I'll read the um, Morning Post version and people can spot the differences. Mm -hmm. Is there no nook of English ground secure from rash assault? Schemes of retirement sown in youth and mid, mid the busy world kept pure as when their earliest flowers of hope were blown must perish. How can they this blight endure? And must he too, who his old delight disown, who scorns a false utilitarian law mid his paternal fields at random throne? Baffle the threat, bright scene, from Orest Head given to the pausing traveller's rapturous glance. Plead for thy peace, thou beautiful romance of nature, and if human hearts be dead, speak, passing winds, ye torrents with your strong and constant voice, protest against the wrong. Thank you so much. So um, I'd like to um, talk about this sonnet with, um, with the painting. Uh, so the, 
uh, when this poem, a sonnet, was published on um, the Morning Post on 16 October 1844, uh, within, within uh, only six Months, six weeks, it was reprinted in more than 60 different newspapers all over the country and causing nationwide uh, controversy. And he was much criticized for expressing a selfish, exclusive, and sentimental uh, protest against uh, modern uh, progress, uh, disregarding working class tourists who could not come to the lake, lakes without railway facilities. And uh, several satirical, satirical poems were also published. And uh, I think a J.B. Pine's painting may also uh, have been a kind of pictorial uh, protest against the world. So the, Jeff, could you show me, the, show us the mm. um, J.B. Pine's painting? Yeah. Yes, yes, ma'am. <laughs> Thank you very much. So um, I, I used this painting for my um, book cover. And then, uh, as I told you, uh, this shows a, a railway, the uh, Kendra and the Mindamia Railway. So, Please look at the painting uh, carefully, and uh, then you can see um, in the middle ground uh, two or three people standing on the orange head and seemingly affluent uh, tourists pointing at a railway, uh, 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 pointing at um, trains. Yeah? And in the foreground, uh, there are uh, an, uh, another two, uh, couple of people or, uh, with uh, fishing rods, I think. And they may also be a tourist, but they, uh, they look more like local people. And then they, uh, uh, they look less affluent. So in this um, painting, both the poor and the rich, and both the railway and the lake uh, compose a harmonious land and pastoral landscape, despite what was the fear that the railway would bring inundation of tourists and destroy peacefulness. And the sonnet was with warns that the railway's rush assault would spoil the bright scene given to the posing traveler's rapturous glance. While Pines, this painting shows how the railway is unobtrusive and even harmonious with this peaceful view from Morris head. So Pines painting may be a silent protest against Wazas' rather controversial remark on working class tourists who were expected to come en masse by railway from industrial uh, cities and by showing this landscape of uh, tranquility with a train greatly trading uh, the smoke. But um, this quietness, uh, pastoral quality of this painting is actually uh, deceptive, I think. Because this is a painting, we do not hear the shrieking sounds of the train, nor do we have to suffer from the smoke, the smoke smell. And as this is taken from, uh, from a distance and from a high point, we cannot see the cuttings and embarkment or the hustle bustle of uh, the crowded towns around the station and the bonus here. So we could say that Pine's painting conceals the negative aspects of modern tourism uh, and only shows a, a positive, alluring image to us. Now, uh, 20th, 21st century, steam engines running through the countryside are looked at fondly with a nostalgic feeling and no one would feel that the smell, uh, shrieking sound, and speed of the huge iron machine to be monstrous or uh, destructive. But it would be said that we are now too familiar with noise, speed, and artificial uh, concrete steel structure in urbanized life 
to appreciate what was this meant by silence and sense of retirement. So I think this painting suggests two things. One is uh, that uh, the railway did not bring devastating change to the Lake District as was it had feared. And it opened the district to uh, everyone who would, who would love this land, landscape and um, deem it as a sort of national property. Two, that the railway certainly brought changes bringing mass tourism and urbanization, although these changes are concealed by the surface tranquility and peacefulness. So modern transport has changed the landscape of the Lake District irreversibly, and it is no longer a retired spot, uh, but accessible to all for, uh, for better or worse. Uh, well, how to appreciate uh, this change differs from person to person, but uh, we could say at least, uh, uh, thanks to Wazos' protest, um, the Lake District's beauty and peacefulness have been um, preserved to some extent, uh, even if this is a, a compromised one. So, yeah. I think in this way, uh, this painting is very interesting. Mm. That, that, I mean, that, that is fascinating, uh, Saiko. Thank you very much. And there's an interesting um, chat going on in, in the chat box that is, is talking about the, the location um, here. So, um, yeah, uh, Paul, Paul Westover, um, hi, Paul, great to have you with us. Says, this was a famous viewing station. It's fun mm -hmm. to think about the likely reaction of people like Gray and West to a canvas like this. And um, uh, Orist Head, I think, is the place where um, uh, Alfred Wainwright talks about mm -hmm. you know, the guidebook mm -hmm. writer having his first sort of revelation of the beauty and the importance of the, mm -hmm. of, of the, of the Lake District landscape. So it's interesting to have that painting um, mm -hmm. you know, in response to Wordsworth's invocation of that, mm -hmm. of, of that location um, mm -hmm. there, you know, Wordsworth's right in the heart of that tradition of a kind of battle over the meaning of that, of that place, I guess. Mm -hmm. I just wanted to very briefly read out um, one of these parodies, if, if, I'm, if I may. Quote, yeah, yeah. They're, they're, you know, they're, they're quite funny. Um, there's one in the Liverpool Mercury, for example, signed by HNRCH. Doesn't say who they are, but he says, is there no nook of English ground secure from class-bred thoughts that settle it once sown in youth and slight the poor man's joys? though pure as theirs. His native country's beauties blown must perish unenjoyed, and he this blight endure. So it's a really striking contemporary critique, which seems to me to basically be accusing um, Wordsworth here of a kind of snobbishness, which is seeking to prevent um, uh, you know, the poor man as presented here, but you know, every man or woman from, from access to the beauty that Wordsworth him, himself is able to enjoy. So as you show in the book, very early kind of critique. And then mm -hmm. I guess the other end of the spectrum from the reading of the poem as a proto-ecological text, mm -hmm. what's it talk about? Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's true. Well, but, uh, yes, I, I think I was the first uh, ambiguous about um, railways. He himself uh, used railways and um, yeah. admi admired its speed. And uh, as early as 1825, uh, he even thought of investigating, uh, investing, uh, sorry, <laughs> investing money in uh, railways by purchasing, by buying uh, uh, shares. And he was also cited about the commercial advantage of the railways. And then he tried to sell that uh, um, his guide and had some invested edition of 1840, 1846 um, to railway tourists. So uh, was uh, never opposed the railway itself, but uh, I think he claimed that uh, we should think carefully about the gain and loss um, to be brought by railways. And uh, he emphasized that uh, we should strike a balance between uh, accessibility, convenience, and the protection of uh, vulnerable uh, nature. And um, I, 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 I also think that uh, he wanted to emphasize uh, um, personal independence and liberty of traveling, uh, which would be uh, spoiled by railway travel. Mm. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I wonder, 
if if we could uh, maybe just go back to the to the pamphlet for just a moment mm -hmm. um just uh i think what i advanced earlier um because the 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 although it's it's sort of billed as a as a reprint from the newspaper um what's interesting is of course that it it does have typical words ah. with style it has lots of changes so it's not quite uh, an exact reprint uh, from the newspaper and funnily enough in, in some places he he changes we're talking about people um coming and words are saying well surely they could walk they don't need an extra into the railway and in the uh, newspaper i'm guessing it says would not grudge an hour and a half's walk mm -hmm. across the skirts of country and he changes it to a two hours walk mm -hmm. um so <laughs> <laughs> is these sort of modest changes that he makes yeah, and well, the... you know actually i tried to walk from kendo to windamia it, it, it took me uh, about three hours so not too <laughs> <long>. <laughs> and, he, and he changes distances here you know the, the distance of about six or seven miles mm -hmm. he changes to eight or nine miles mm -hmm. but but more significant isn't it is in the in the poem itself um mm -hmm. how this is that moment where it changes from is there no nook of English ground secure to, and there's the change to the N, is then no nook mm -hmm. of English ground secure. And, it, and the correction down below um, where it's printed as passing, but he changes it to pausing. I mean, that, I guess that's a, that's a typo as it were, a, a proper mm -hmm. correction. But mm -hmm. I think Saiko, you mentioned too in your book, um, is it is it Ronsley, I think it is, who, who talks about the passing traveler. Yeah. So he, he's read it as passing even yeah. though I might say pausing. Yeah, yeah so th this poem was uh, quite often quoted by several people, but sometimes misquoted, and the misquotation is, uh, <laughs> again, very interesting, I think. Yeah. yeah. The, the, the theme of your book um, is Wordsworthy and Tourism. Mm -hmm. um, and I'm, I was interested that, that through the, the, the various decades, um, mm -hmm. Wordsworthy and Tourism, you sort of interpret to mean Sort of different things uh, mm -hmm. and you hinted at some of them in your in your overview earlier on i wonder if you wouldn't mind just sort of saying how how many different facets or aspects of wordsworthy and tourism mm -hmm. you, you kind of identify mm -hmm. uh, okay um well wordsworth and tourism in my form uh, uh, but by wordsworth and tourism in the former book i meant uh, a tourism featuring places related uh, to with wordsworth's life and poetry um, and then these places were incorporated into the guidebooks and they're making, uh, they made a world of country. But on the other mm. hand, um, in the present book, I am dealing with the new types of Wazasian tourists. So um, who, who did not necessarily read Wazas as a book, but uh, actually inherited Wazasian or uh, romantic spirit of travel. Uh, so that spirit of uh, respecting individual freedom and personal uh, independence or the adventurous spirit which, uh, to tr uh, with, with which to try to go off the uh, beaten track and uh, mm. commune with uh, uh, world nature. So the, uh, this romantic spirit of travel first appeared in the uh, early motorists and cyclists who came to the Lake District around the early 20th century, the, the first decade of the 20th century. They were uh, comparatively wealthy, affluent classes, and uh, they despised the railway excursionists who were bound with the uh, itinerary uh, imposed by the tourist industry. And they tried to get away from crowd and uh, commercialized tourism to explore new territories um, which could be not reached by uh, railway. And they enjoyed uh, some freedom and independence. Then um, when motor tourism became popularized after the First World War and road congestion um, became a big problem, now in the uh, wave of na nationwide interval for outdoor boom movement, there appeared those who tried to get away from the highway and uh, enjoy uh, walking in some hidden lanes, hidden valleys or mountains where cars, motor cars cannot come. Mm. 
-hmm. And they claim that uh, walking is much superior to motor cars and the best way to enjoy a Lake District uh, landscape. So, um, in a way, after uh, transport revolution from railways to uh, motor cars, uh, we can see a kind of revival of romantic um, pedestrianism. And then, um, further interesting thing is that among these walkers, too, there can be observed some uh, kind of discrimi discriminative in instinct it, to try to discriminate uh, solitary, more independent romantic walkers from yeah. hikers and uh, who walk in a large group. So um, there are uh, always, there has always been a conflict between romantic, authentic traveler and mass tourists um, between those who can really appreciate nature and those yeah. who just follow uh, the fashion. I think that this dichotomy is quite interesting, the big theme of this book, yeah. So, so in that sense, we're we're kind of walking in the spirit of nature, a spirit mm -hmm. of romanticism, rather, uh, rather than as you say earlier on, yeah. we were going from place yeah. to place to happen to be in the literal footsteps. Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah, yeah. I mean, one of the big revelations for me, Seiko, was this mm -hmm. sense of seeing motoring as um, a, a sort of inheritance and, and as, as a form of romanticism itself. Mm -hmm. I mean, uh, there's a really nice comment and question from. Um, Bill Shaw in the chat as well. So really great to have you with us, Phil. Um, and he says, it, it, in the sonnet, in a carriage upon the banks of the Rhine, Wordsworth is critical of coach travel, describing the effects of viewing the landscape at high speed as a dance of objects that saddens the defrauded heart. And Phil then asks, what would he have made of car travel? Um, and I must say, when I came to the book, I was thinking that these modes of travel would be sort of like increasingly bad, if you see what I mean. Um, one of the things that was so striking was this sense that for, for early motorists, you know, who includes people like um, Hardwick Wormsley, the great champion of Wordsworth, but the ability to drive your car around and, as you say, put your, put your, your um, roof down and so on and experience the breeze and the sense of movement um, and the sense of freedom, that they actually saw this as a Wordsworthian process. And you've got some lovely sort of links between their writing and Wordsworth's writing and also Shelley I mean you quote Ode to the West Wind at one point because one of these one of these motorists I think is picking up on Ode to mm -hmm. the West Wind and feels that the experience of driving is inheriting mm -hmm. this kind of Shelleyan um, mm -hmm. mode of being and that was so nicely kind of counterintuitive really. Mm -hmm. Yes yes I, I think so well the, so while the road was not so uh, <laughs> crowded yes so yeah I guess going with motor cars is like a one can really feel the sense of moving, the sense of uh, and the wind and the rain and the really mm. romantic language, yes, imagery is very interesting, revealing, yes. You, you mentioned that, um, I think cars, you, you record going by at 16 miles an hour, mm -hmm. um, and Wordsworth, I think, writing a poem in, in Grasmere about people going by in carriages, I think he talks about it seven miles an hour, this remarkable yeah. speed mm -hmm. of seven miles an hour. So we're going from seven miles to 16 miles yes. uh, in, a, in a century, <laughs> passing by Dove Cottage, I guess. Yes. <laughs> and Paul, Paul Westover sort of captures in the, in the chat something Jeff and I were talking about. Paul says, uh, it's too bad that we don't have Mr. Toad's Tour of the Lakes, um, a latter-day sequel to Dr. Syntax. And it did feel very much like, yeah, to, you know, Toad of Toad Hall, uh, mm -hmm. poop, pooping around um, mm -hmm. in, in, his, in his motor car. A strange, mm -hmm. a strange combination of words with a Mr. Toad, not two figures. <laughs> but the 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 other again, one of the striking things was the charabangs, uh, these yeah. charabangs, and and they they were regarded, weren't they, as a kind of nuisance um, mm -hmm. by 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 motorists, by walkers. Um, I don't know whether you were able to say a little bit more about those, but they they how they were just perceived as a well, just overwhelming. The Sharaban. So, yeah, so yeah. Sharaban people were, were usually the, the Lake District um, roads are very, very uh, narrow. So, the, the, actually, they were really um, dangerous. So, the, they were seen um, very nuisance. But uh, um, so it, it was not only the, uh, the, the Sharaban tourists, but the tourists in general uh, were. Um, being uh, complained 
about uh, by the local people. There, there has always been a um, conflict between local people and um, um, tourists, and even even whether the workers, whether the tourists, uh, travelers, uh, um, sometimes being criticized. And, and I I found a very interesting article in from uh, 1925, I think, and then. Uh, and the local people complained that those are worthy of some pilgrims, pilgrims uh, uh, all uh, rooted up all the daffodils from the <laughs> uh, water. <laughs> so we should be very careful about uh, those are worthy of some people. It's like <laughs> interesting thing. <laughs> not only the turban people. No. But then, but then you mentioned too about. Um... Uh, about the the drivers who then sort of do a bit of thrill seeking, and and they try you you mentioned about them sort of driving around roads where they can't see around the corner, so that there's just that little bit of thrill coming in, um, and how the council wasn't it right that they they closed Sharabangs, uh, they closed 25 roads to Sharabangs because it was just considered too dangerous for them. So you know we have conversations now, don't we, about green lanes and four by fours and. <laughs> and off-road bikes and it's 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 sort of very similar in a way isn't it to, yeah, to yeah, who, yeah. who has right of way almost in, yeah. in these ways um, well maybe one or two cars trying that kind of thing it would be all right but maybe a hundred or two hundred uh, cars try to do that kind of thing so it, it should be a very nuisance thing yeah i don't think we hear anybody complaining about cyclists um i don't know whether uh, oh yeah cyclists do and when they came came in, in, in large number of people. There's sometimes cyclists uh, run in about uh, 50, 50 cyclists or something like that. In that case, uh, they were uh, complained about the, the always solitary cy cyclists were all right, but uh, not group cyclists. <laughs> <laughs> I'm, I'm, I'm conscious that we're sort of starting to run out of time. Oh yeah. So much uh, great information. But one of the things I really wanted to ask you about before we finish, Psycho is mm -hmm. um, the chapter which you sort of dedicate to World War One and, and the aftermath of World War One, which was you know was wasn't something I was expecting really, and obviously I was you know very interested in that. Jeff and I have worked on you know Grassmere during the wars, during the Napoleonic Wars together, so it's very interesting to then have this revisiting of Grassmere in the context of, of of the later wars. And you talk about how building on the patriotism that people found in Wordsworth's poetry and his links to the landscape of the lakes that many of the lake districts themselves actually became um, dedicated war memorials. Mm -hmm. um, so can you just sketch how that came about for us please? Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Okay, um, so the, uh, the war renewed uh, people interested in Wordsworth uh, because uh, Wordsworth wrote uh, a lot of um, sonnets on, for, for liberty and independence, and was also uh, experienced the, con um, the, the, the war, Napoleonic War, so the, the people could uh, share the world as a sense of crisis. Mm. And then, um, uh, and during the war time, uh, the idea of defending the country and um, fighting for liberty were easily connected with uh, ideas of protection of nature, beautiful places, and uh, securing free access to those uh, beauty spots. And then uh, these uh, combined ideas produced uh, an idea of preserving uh, mountain tops as war memorials to those who fought for uh, uh, national liberty. And in the Lake District, uh, 12, I think a 12 mountain tops around Spyhead Pass were uh, donated to the National Trust uh, to preserve as a war memorial. And uh, I think it is interesting that uh, the act of climbing to those uh, mountains came to be regarded as uh, uh, at the same time as the act of remembering those who died for liberty and also act of uh, preserving the mountain tops from Russia thought from um, such as a road, road construction uh, car coming there. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Well, as, as Simon says, we, we, we are drawing to a, we're drawing to near our closing time. One of the things I find remarkable um, about your book too uh, are, are simply the number of uh, references that you make, the, the number of newspapers that you refer to, uh, whether it's the Burnley News or the Lancashire Evening News, 
there, or the Leeds Mercury, there are just so many, many references that you found, which is, which is just wonderful to read. Um, mm -hmm. But one of the, um, maybe, maybe as a sort of a closing moment, uh, if we could ask you uh, to read from, from your book, this, this issue about Wordsworth and the influence that he had, um, and how would it have been otherwise? So if, if, I, if we could maybe just um, invite you to read from page 116 of your book, please. Okay, um, well, I saw the, the, the 160, 16 is, a, this is a chapter three, which and then this passage discusses what would have uh, happened to the Lake District if was had not been. And I will start with a quotation from the Times uh, in October uh, 1911. And, uh, this is about a, a controversy over uh, if 14 scale bridge uh, should be preserved or uh, replaced with a new a new bridge for motor vehicles. Okay, so I will start from uh, the quotation. Grasmere would still have been as lovely and Helvellyn as sublime if the poets whom they inspired had never lived and written. Much as the interest of the Lake District has been enriched by its literary association. There is no, rain, no region in England or in Europe more self-sufficient in the singular and distinctive charm of its scenery. Bridges, whether celebrated in literature or not, possesses it in, it, in an unusual degree the peculiar kind of beauty which comes of the conflict of human structures with an opposing natural power, unquote. This article posits fascinating questions. Would we see Grasmere and Helvellyn as lovely and sublime had Wordsworth never lived? Is landscape always aesthetically mediated such that we see it through poet and artist eyes? Or can it be self-sufficient in its beauty? Is the region's singular and distinctive charm self-evident? Or a Wordsworthian concept conception that the Times correspondence has inherited. Another complication appears when we consider that Wadsworth himself believed in the Lake District's intrinsic self-sufficient beauty that does not need history, tradition, or local association. Whereas subsequent tourists, whether Wadsworth admirers or not, all tended to see the landscape for its literary association. The Times correspondence questioned this tendency and admonished us to value the natural and architectural beauty of the Lake District for their self-sufficient charm. Chapter two argues that the cultural values added by Wordsworth and other Lake poets and artists played important roles in 19th century campaigns for preserving the Lake District. But by 1911, there were some who appreciated the singularity of natural scenery. Perhaps the independent individual rapid motion of traveling by motor car uh, uh, had fostered a new appreciation of lakeland scenery, irrespective of and, and enriched by and enriched by a literary association. The motor age has certainly created its own poetry, although as we shall see, that poetry continued to be deeply informed by the world version or romantic view of the world. That's pretty, pretty <laughs> good place to end up. Um, yeah. I think, we'll you know, now uh, 250 years after what the death and how we value the Lake District uh, varies from person to person. And many people came here without knowing at all Wordsworth. But um, what I think is interesting is that even those who do not know Wordsworth, they still tend to tend to look at the Lake District through Wordsworth and frame uh, because the tourist industry has um, has uh, has been appropriating Wordsworth and um, ethos and Wordsworth words and phrases. Yeah, so that is very ironical and a very interesting thing. And, and as you point out, the, the World Heritage bid 
uh, very much featured Wordsworth. Um, mm -hmm. So be better that he did live. I think we do. <laughs> we, do we do agree. Yeah. Um, that, that's a very nice, uh, the quotation there is a very nice link to next week's event. Um, mm -hmm. ne next week, we um, will focus very much on Wordsworth's Guide to the Lake District. Mm -hmm. um, we've got Paul Westover uh, with us this evening. Um, next week, uh, Nick Mason, who is at the same university, and together they've worked on this definitive guide, uh, sorry, definitive bibliographical mm -hmm. history um, with every version of the of the guide available online through the Romantic oh. Circles website. And uh, we, we'll have lots of things to show as well. Uh, a lot of their research was based in this library. So if you can join us next Thursday, um, we will be looking at Wordsworth's guide in, this, in, in the closest detail uh, for, and that should be a wonderful end to our series. Um, Thank you, Seiko. That was really something. As you could tell, Simon and I thoroughly enjoyed reading your book. We both learned a huge amount from it. Um, it's it's such a it's a scholarly book, but it's the best scholarly book because it's very very readable and and it's a great pleasure to read. Um, it's great for Wordsworthians. If you're interested in social history, it's great. If you're interested in transport history, it's great. Um, uh, it's incredibly relevant to today, as, as we keep saying, that we're drawing the parallels from the past uh, um, and, and really helping inform um, how, how we approach the present uh, and the changes that are taking place again. Um, and when we started, you said you had some doubts about this being a talk uh, not in your first language. Um, mm. Well, let's just say you needn't have worried <laughs> because that, that was just really, really something. So, so thank you. Um, as always, much. thank you to Han. Sorry. So, hey, thank you very much. Yes. But, uh, thank you. Um, as always, thank you to Hannah. Um, there's there's real force for good in the background that, that keeps this very much on track. Um, thank you to everybody who's joined us. Um, thank you for those who commented uh, and the questions. I did like Anthony Harding's uh, little poem at the end there about the motor bus uh, and the smell of petrol. It's interesting through lockdown um, when Grasmere seems to have been cleared of pollution. So when the car goes by, you do notice, you notice that pellet petrol smell, um, which, which your, bog, your book sort of pointed out again. Um, so thank you everybody. And we very much look forward to seeing you again next week, if you can make it. Thank you and good night. Bye.